morning. Are you? Good. That means we got lots of extra energy, right? Lots of extra energy to give back to the Lord everything he's given to us, right? All right, we're going to set the tone this morning. We're going to cry out to the deep. Come on. Let's give him glory this morning. Tell him I've got a river.
to deep cries out to deep cries out to we cry out and we cry out to you jesus come on one more deep cries out to deep cries out to deep cries out to deep cries out to we cry out and we cry out to you jesus Hello, 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 hello. There we go. Give me a little more sound. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. All right, you may be seated as some of you have figured out. All right. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Um, God is good, amen? I thought you had to go potty. Okay, all right. <laughs> All right. Um, marriage conference this coming weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, if you have not registered, please do so online. Um, uh, come be blessed. I know that we, uh, uh, I really do believe that uh, people are changed, marriages are changed in this conference. I know it's Pastor Nett and I doing it, but. Uh, just well, Ren and James are helping us out this year, but last year it was so effective, and uh, God just anoints it. Okay, so uh, if you need help in your marriage, or if you're about to get married, or if you want to better your marriage, come and join us this weekend, our next this coming weekend. Say yes, sir, Pastor. All right, good job. All right, um, what else we got going on? Mills of Grace on the twenty. 20- March 5th, that's right. March 5th, I keep saying the second. It's March 5th. How many people you need? Need two people. So uh, if you could help us out, we would appreciate it. Um, uh, see Miss Janie and uh, b- go be blessed. They are just awesome in the streets. Amen? Okay. Um, what else is going on around here? Oh, Good Friday service on the 25th at 7 p.m. That is, you're going to be blessed. Pastor Ness putting together some stuff and you are going to uh, uh, enjoy what uh, God did or what Jesus did the night before. So you will uh, be blessed. So come to that. All right? Yes? Classes tonight, finally. Uh, we, uh, we probably messed up. We probably destroyed our momentum and got our classes uh, with all of this. So I'm begging God for forgiveness. And then I'm asking you to get back in, in line and get going. If you are a part of this church, you n- know that Sunday morning is not it. Wednesday night is, is, is really presence-driven and allowing Holy Ghost to speak into our lives. Uh, but Sunday evening, our Destiny Discovery classes, that's how you grow. That's how you develop. That's how you get better. Amen? And uh, if you want to walk this walk and become what God's called you to be, uh, you need to get in and, and study and know. You need to know what you believe. You need to know why you believe it. Amen? Don't just follow what everybody else says because it gets messed up, and, and we all have uh, uh, places of error, right? Okay, turn me down a little bit. I'm echoing. Thank you. All right. What else we got? Hey, you, you that keep me in line. Anything else? Who's got nugget this morning? Huh? Lori? All right. All right. Y'all, y'all, uh, I think that's it. Nobody? I miss Vivian. She kept me in line. Lorinda and Annette's not doing a good job at all. Uh, I need Vivian back. Y'all, y'all write her. Get her on Facebook. Say, hey, we need you back. Can you do that for me? Yes? Okay. You know what we need to do? We need to pray for all these people that are sick. You know, um, I got hit uh, last last Thursday. We we finalized something. No, uh, last a week ago Wednesday, Pastor Nett finished preaching. She came home and she started. It started attacking her. Thursday we went and ha- handled something. By the end of the day, she was really bad. And then Friday and Saturday, she was 
down, and then it attacked me, and it, it was, it was, I didn't get as bad as P- Pastor Nett, but it was just one after another, and we're blaming Joey for bringing it in, so um, y'all just, y'all just rebuke him, and, uh, uh, but uh, he's a pilot, and he went to Yankeeville and brought it back to us, amen, so, uh, but just be praying, there's a lot of people that are fighting the sickness, uh, a lot of people, is, I don't, is it really the flu? Is that what it is? Uh, I, I guess so. But many people have gotten it, so you guys just lift them up and pray for them. But anyway, it messed us up. And what bothers me is whenever I am out, it's like, okay, pastor's out. We could be out. Every time I'm out, this is what happens. Seriously. So uh, I'm going to make me a, a, a dummy model, and I'm going to sit it right there. Someone said I already have one. All right, God got you. I got you. I got you. All right. All right. All right. Enough of the jokes. Kingdom services. I just saw that. We are being blessed awesomely. Uh, our heart was to build a business that would would bless people. Uh, uh, to the single mom that can't afford to get something fixed. Uh, 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 the elderly that can't do it or... Uh, uh, in whatever fashion, and our heart is to, to do uh, things um, in any type of fashion, uh, uh, fix up, clean up, yards, house, move, uh, small construction jobs, big construction jobs, whatever, but try to be a blessing. Uh, make enough money to cover the staff uh, and get them paid, uh, but uh, mainly to be a blessing. Build up uh, equity to, to go in and do something for someone that can't afford it. We want to bridge that with what we're doing in Mills of Grace and, and help our neighborhood. But God's just start, just uh, has anointed it. Uh, 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 Travis came on, and, and, and it, it's just exploded since then. So we are, 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 are thankful for him coming on and, and doing that. So y'all give him a hand and bless him. and Because uh, he's stepping out in faith. Because, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, tomorrow he may not have work, and, and today he does, and tomorrow he may not, and the next day we don't know. So uh, he's stepping out in faith, and y'all just be praying for Liz because she's got to put up with him. Amen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have a huge yard, and no one's fixing it. No one's doing anything to it. It was get, getting all uh, messed up by grubs and whatever. And Travis came over. He worked from morning to night. And he did a wonderful job, and he c- came over the second day and did more work. And then he's coming over tomorrow, and he's going to do more work. And it's just, I have never seen my yard, even as messed up as it is, as good as it does. I'm so excited. Awesome. All right. So if you find, uh, if you have some uh, small jobs that you need done, please see uh, Clayton or James or Travis. And then uh, if you hear out on the outside, because we want it to be an outreach. One of the, the, the best tools for, to, for touching the co- community, um, for getting people saved, uh, was the daycare. Uh, if, we didn't get, if they didn't join the church, we, we ministered to them and helped them through uh, life crises, and they, they have always looked back to us for it. We want to expand that, and we feel like the same thing's going to happen with Kingdom Services. So if you guys would just lift it up in prayer, if you want to donate to it to, to help support it, uh, uh, you know, make a note in your, in the, in your giving uh, and whatever. If you can find some jobs uh, out there for us, we'd appreciate it and, and communicate that to us. But just lift it up. We really believe that it's going to be a blessing to the community. Amen? All right. Anything else? No, you guys come on forward to do the tithes and offerings. Let's pray. And then, uh, Miss Lori, can you come on up? You guys want to sit for a second? She's going to do the, the nugget. Let's bow our heads for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight or this morning, and we just ask that you bless this offering. We ask that you cause uh, uh, this house to prosper, Father. We ask for... Uh, the money to do the ministries and to do the work that you want us to do. We ask that it come forth from the north, the south, the east, and the west. We ask, Father God, that you give us favor in all business endeavors that we do. We ask that you cause the money to multiply, Father God, that we may further the kingdom. It takes money to go. It takes money to do, Father God. We just thank you for it. We just ask, Father God, that you bless the giver 
And Father God, we just ask that you pour out upon us a blessing that we cannot contain. We ask, Father God, for the buildings and all, all things that we use to be paid off and paid in full, Father. We have trips to go to the Philippines, Peru, Philippines again, and Mexico, Father God, that need to be paid for. And we just ask that that money come forward in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Okay, if you guys could wait just a few minutes as they get their offerings ready. And then while she's talking, then start passing the buckets. Thank you. All righty. Um, well, as some of you know, we had the opportunity a couple weeks ago. There he is, looking for my husband. To go to Pennsylvania. We are also in Yankeeville. And... Um, because that's where Bill's from, and we, just to see his family and visit. And while we were up there, he has a friend who is a pastor of a church. And so that Sunday morning, we went to his church. And it was just so amazing to see that his message was just completely in line with what we've been hearing and been learning. And um, then Annette gave her nugget on Sunday, and I started, I was like <laughs> hitting Bill and flipping out because it was on Joshua 3, and that's exactly what he preached on. And it was huge. And now Greg's class is on faith, and there's so much that God's speaking to us about faith. And so I had already thought about doing this as a nugget, and then Annette did that, and I was like, hey, it's kind of the same. It's a piggyback, but I think we need to hear it because it's coming over and over. And you may think, well, maybe it's just for y'all because y'all were the ones in Pennsylvania, but we're a part of y'all. And so what we get is for us to give also, and I don't think it's just for us. So he was on Joshua 3, and he spoke about being a Joshua generation, and that the Moses generation, they walked across when they saw the water part. They saw that the ground was dry, and then they walked across, and every day they saw the pillar of fire, or they saw the cloud, and they did what they saw, but the Joshua generation didn't see. They heard, and were given commandments, and then they obeyed. And like Annette said last week, then they stepped out in faith into the Jordan. And even when they stepped out, they still didn't see because it stopped way up there, up ahead, and they had to wait for it to recede to them. So they still had to walk out in faith. And so I just feel like there's so much being said about stepping out in faith and that we're a Joshua generation. We don't see it. We need to hear it and act and obey. And he focused on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, the, what the items in the ark mean and how they represent Jesus, the two stone tablets, which are the law and the word, and the jar of manna, which Jesus is the bread of life. And then Aaron's rod, his staff that um, represents his death, burial, and resurrection. And he, I really, afterwards, I was like, you know, I don't know a lot about the story of Aaron's staff budding. So I went and looked it up, and, you know, they had all the rods from the leaders of the tribes of Israel, and then they chose him for the Levites, and they come back the next day, and it's completely, it's budded, and it's um, green, and it's produced almonds, and thanks for the training in this church, I questioned why almonds, you don't hear almonds a lot, you know, you hear grapes, you hear olives, but why almonds, and so I looked up that word almonds, and that word almonds means, the root word means to be alert, to awaken, and to watch. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Because how many times have we heard, awaken, be alert, be on the lookout, you need to watch. It was like to be alert, to watch like an awake. Like something's been dead, but it's about to rise, and you need to be alert and watch. So I just feel there's a lot of encouragement. Step out in faith, even when you can't see it. We're a Joshua generation. We're not Moses. We're going to step out even when we don't know and to be alert. Be watching for what's going to come because it's going to come. That's awesome. Oh, my goodness. That's good word. Amen. That is good word. Come on, stand up. We're going to step out in faith. I, I, I wish I could share with you all that happened this week, but I, I would take up all the service and and uh, y'all already blame me for that already. So uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you individually, one on one, God just moved miraculously this week. I'll just say that it was awesome, awesome, awesome. So if you would get ready, come on up here. Let's worship the King. 
Uh, everybody, before you walk up here, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we desire to be in your presence this morning. We desire, Father God, to have an encounter. We no longer want just the ordinary. We want the supernatural. We want face-to-face -face encounters, Father God. We want you to fill this place with your presence. We say yes and amen to everything that you want to do today. And all God's people said amen. Come on up and let's worship the King.
I feel like I feel like there's uh, been this enticement from the enemy. The light shining on me right now, right here. That we just step out just a step away just a little bit so it's not so bright so it's not so intense the problem with that is is it's a point of relief but what happens is we get sucked further and further and further and if we would stay in the light and endure the process and the time we would get to the place that as we're going that way says we'll never obtain and the Lord is calling some specific people today he says you have withdrawn and you have justified your withdrawing and it's your justification it's not my allowment and he's saying without con condemnation he's saying come back and get back into position he's saying now now the tide has pulled back and there's another wave coming and the Lord says I need you I have placed you as markers to what I'm doing come and get back in, pl in place
the power yours is
I want to I want to hear it. Let heaven come. Let heaven come. Every voice. secret place. Let heaven come. In our place of disobedience. Dear Heavenly Father, please invade every place of our life. Invade with the kingdom. Invade with your love. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you all honor, all glory. And all God's people said, Amen and amen. Hug your neighbor. Tell them you're glad they're here this morning. Whoa, Jesus is good. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. You are more than enough. All right. Now, guys, uh, oops. Um, there is, uh, if, if I could, <laughs> if I could get, could you get that please? Uh, if I could get your serious attention, um, I, I am going to battle this until we are, we get rid of it. But this sickness stuff is, I'm, I'm tired of it. I am tired of it. Uh, every time I turn around, I get a call. Someone else is fighting it. So I want you to make a promise to me. Uh, however you pray, whatever your devotion time is, I want you to dedicate some time every day to, to pray, uh, seek God's face on how we can get rid of this. Amen? Uh, I, I, let's get rid of it in this house and it not be able to touch us, and then we'll, then we'll move outside of this house. All right, can you do that? So reach over and grab your neighbor's hand and bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just ask, Father, that you would help us, empower us, fill us to overflowing with the anointing, with wisdom, with understanding. Father, that we may know you face to face, that we may 
uh, be, uh, that you may breathe life into us, that we may have that power, that life-changing, that life-giving power within us, that we may be able to speak life, that we may rebuke the spirit of infirmity in every area uh, that comes, Father God, and that we would have wisdom to recognize when he is uh, uh, knocking at the door. Many times he's slipping in, Father God, and we are not recognizing, whether it be through diet, whether it be through actions, whether it be through uh, lack of sleep, whether it be uh, through uh, 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 disobedience or sin, Father God, we just ask that you help us to close every door and to get rid of this thing, Father God, because it costs us. And that, Father God, it steals from us. And we say no more. We rebuke the devourer. And we say, be whole in Jesus' name. And every person that has sickness right now in our families or in our who we know, we reach out, we extend the, the hand of faith, we speak life to them, and we say, be whole in Jesus' name. Fever, leave. We say, fever, leave right now. Lungs clear up and open up. Bronchial tubes open up. We say sinuses open up. We say viral bacterial out in Jesus' name. And we call, call, say the bloodstream to be pure and whole. Digestive tracts be cleansed and clear. And a proper diet flow through them. And, Father, we just say yes and amen. And all God's people said yes and amen. You're supposed to say yes and amen. All right. All right, y'all ready to be blessed? Okay, you're going to have to wait until Rem preaches. But today, you're going to be blessed by <laughs> Pastor James. Come on up, man. <laughs> oh, he, he had it right. He had it right. My wife is the blessing, I'll tell you. Uh, all right, let's pray. Dear Lord, Father, um, let me convey you to them properly, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your word, your truth, Father, your revelation. Just uh, flow this day, Father. Uh, let none of me come through, Father, my opinion, my thoughts, my flesh. Father, let it die right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, good morning. Last time I was up here, I talked. Uh, how many of y'all were here? It's been, what, two months? Okay, well... It's kind of a continuation of that. It's a part two, but it's like a really long <laughs> distance in between. But last time I was here, I was talking about guarding the presence of God because we all love being in the presence of the Lord. Um, and I was talking along the lines of, of Hophni and Phineas. Um, I started it out with that story. And uh, how many of y'all know have read that part of the Bible? That they weren't the best guys in the in the best examples in the Bible, and uh, you know it really. I think that's probably why I'm still here because it irritates the fire out of me. You know to know that that somebody was in the church, represented the church, and they didn't have enough regard for what was trying to be conveyed. To, to get correct, you know, and, and, and it's, 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 I guess that's the part of me that needs refining because it, it really, it, it does, it makes me sad. I'm, I'm serious, I feel like weeping right now just thinking about it, you know, but how does that happen? You know, how do, how do we go from coming, pursuing Christ to where these are these guys, I'm sure at one point in time they were pursuing Christ just as we were. How do they get to the point to where they just didn't care anymore? You know, that, that's what I want to try to cover. And uh, we'll go ahead and throw a disclaimer out there. If, uh, you know, I'm not talking about anything specific. This is not a rebuke of any kind. I don't, well, I know some of y'all's issues, but that's beside the point. I'm not talking about your issue right now. I really want to build up the church. You know, a lot of times I, uh, we always try to preach to the those new believers that come in here, but if we don't properly convey Jesus when we're here, what are the, what are they going to leave with? So let me let me if you weren't here, I'm gonna brush up on it. First Samuel two, uh, twelve through seventeen. I'm gonna read it in the message. If you can pull it up for everybody, it says Eli's own sons were a bad lot. They did not know God, and they could have not cared 
any less about the customs of priests among the people. So they were already in a position of authority in the church. Ordinarily, when someone offered a sacrifice, the priest servants were supposed to come up and while the meat was boiling, stab a three-pronged fork into the cooking pot. The priest then got whatever came up on the fork. But this is how Eli's sons treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh to offer sacrifices to God. Before they had even burned the fat to God, the priest servants would interrupt whoever was sacrificing and say, hand over some of that meat for the priest to roast. He doesn't like boiled meat. He likes it rare. This is, the, this is man's object. First, let the fat be burned, God's portion, then take all you want. The servant would demand, no, I want it now. If you, give it, if you won't give it to me, I'll take it. It was a horrible sin these young servants were committing and, the, and in, the right, in the presence of God, desecrating the holy offering to God. You know, that's uh, I want to convey basically anybody, anytime somebody comes to the church, now they're here to make an offering to God. I'm relating that to present day because it's not just about what they did back then because it still happens in here today. You know, it's like uh, that moment when Hannah came up, you know, she was wailing and crying out. She had a need that needed to be met. She was barren in the womb, and she wanted something really bad. You know, uh, what's cool about it is God takes the part that we don't want, and he gives us the meat. He gives us the best portion. You know, so many people come in here all the time. They're trying to lay down their addictions, or they're trying to lay down their burdens. What Jesus are we conveying to them? I'll continue on what, what Eli, his father, even said about his own children. Uh, can you pull that up, 22? Abner tried again, turned back. No, that's First Samuel, not Second Samuel. I'll read it off my, here you go. It says, now Eli was very old. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing, all of Israel. And now they lay down with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of the meetings. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, this is not a good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now Samuel, the boy, continued to grow in both stature and, and in favor with the Lord and also with men. You know, that goes back to Hannah getting uh, coming to the Lord. She got blessed by God. And to the point to where she was weeping and crying at the altar to where Eli thought that she was actually drunk said, why are, you, why, are you, why are your lips moving but nothing's coming out? I think that he might have even been, Eli himself might have even been affected by his own children. They relate what's, what happens out there. You know, for somebody that worked in the temple, the first thing, if I saw somebody up here, they're weeping and they're crying and their lips are moving but nothing's coming out, I relate it to spiritual things, not natural things. So it obviously was affecting what was going on inside that church. But, you know, when Hannah was blessed, she was blessed with a child. She automatically turned that offering back and gave it to God. That's where Samuel came in. Samuel was the product of that. And this is why I know that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you do. Samuel grew up in the same house as Hophni and Phinehas. You know what I'm saying? So, God, they were coming up against Israel. So I see this man as being of high value outside of the house of the Lord. And even though he had great success, he had the skin disease that if left untreated would eventually kill him. His flesh was rotting away. What's our biggest enemy here? Uh, what's our biggest enemy in the house of the Lord? It's the flesh. We always want what's out there sometimes more than what we wanted here. You know, Nate, 
Nahum had a, a gift. He was great at battle. You know, and our, out there we have great gifts. And a lot of times when we come into the church, we try to bring those gifts to the body of Christ. And a lot of those are amazing gifts. I, for example, uh, had the gift of working uh, of, of children. Out there, I didn't really know what it was. Out there, it got perverted. In here, God opened my eyes. I saw my gift, and I started working immediately. Well, not immediately, but after some time in this process, I started working with, with teens, with children. And then I, once I opened my eyes, I discovered what the gift really was. But out there, it was perverted. Out there, I was nice to the children in hopes of getting in bed with mama. I'm being real in here. Come on. Come on. Y'all got to help me out. Out there, I had success. God's gift was perverted. Naaman was the same way. He had great success, and out there he could be as successful as he wanted to because he was not in covenant with God. When he was in covenant with God, that means that he had to cover himself and identify himself as a leper. But out there, as long as he kept it covered up, he could be as successful as he wanted. Same thing today. Just don't bring your issue up, and we won't talk about it. Second Kings 5, uh, verses 2 through 5. We'll continue on. It says, Now the Syrian, one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. She had worked in the service of Nahum's wife. She said to his, her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who were in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now Nahum went and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He said, Go to the prophet in Israel. The, 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 the girl told the wife, said, Go to Israel, meet this prophet, because in the house of the Lord, you can be healed. And he must have been so desperate that he actually went to his king and said, hey, you know, that little slave girl I took, she really has some good advice. I really want to be healed. It's to the point where I can't cover it up anymore. This way I imagine this conversation had to win, but it probably was an uncomfortable conversation. He said, I can't cover it up anymore. I really need to be healed. You know, Things sometimes get too bad, and that's what draws us in here in the first place. We're, we're drawn because of that, what we need. The only thing we can get, the only one that can give it to us is the Lord. I, that's the story of my life right there. But when I got here, boy, I tell you what, I met a God, man, unlike any other. Skip down to 8. It says, but when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel he had torn his clothes in dismay. He sends this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Nahum to me. And he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Nahum went to his horse and his chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a message out to him, sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Nahum became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call in the name of his Lord and God and his God would heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Albana and the Parfar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Nahum turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go and wash and be cured.
So Nahum went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. You know, I, I reflected the story. You know, you know who the hero of this story really is? Any ideas? A little girl. A little girl was just expressing how her faith in her God sent word to another, to another. Miraculous things started happening. That's just a side note. So, but the Elisha, Elisha set out a plan for him to receive wholeness, to receive healing. And that's, a, you know, a, I guess it's one of my things. I'm always up here, and I'm always talking about the process, the process, the process. You know, I think if you go back on all my words, I, 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 majority of the time I'm talking about this process of being whole and and going through the motions of, of ultimately receiving the, your promise, our promise, the promise, Jesus. You know, and I think I talk about it so much because I know how difficult this process is. I'm probably a perpetual student of the process. I've been stuck going and going and going. But every time I have to come to a place where it's uncomfortable and I push through and I push past and I, I, I continue to get revelation upon revelation, glory upon glory of what God's trying to do, what he wants for me. So a lot of times we come to the church and we already have these preconceived ideas, just like Nahum did, wave your hand, call on the name of the Lord, and I can get back out to what I was doing it before. I would go back to what I was being successful at, and it doesn't always work that way. You know, just remember when I started this, it was talking about how not to become like Hophni and Phineas. That's the whole point of my message is we, we, we don't want to get off of that subject. But Nahum was very angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought they would surely come out and stand and call upon the name of his Lord. They would wave his hand in the place and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the Albana and the Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters in Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a rage. These preconceived ideas that we have of what it's going to take for us to receive our promise isn't always God's plan. It isn't always exactly what he has for us. And the length of time that it takes for it to happen depends a lot of times on us and our willingness to grab a hold of and apply the very simple and basic principles of God. Pray, read, devotion time. It doesn't, it, it, it's not this complicated formula that he's laid out for us. He says, go, wash, and be clean. If we start this walk with Jesus, this is why this message isn't just for those who've been in the church for a long time and there might be Hophni and Phineas. This is for new believers who come in here. If you come in here with the mindset that we're just going to wave hands over you and lay our hands on you and pray for you, yes, we do those things, but faith can do those things. But if you believe it's going to be easy and it's not going to require something from you, you might be deceived. You, you, you might not fully understand how this kingdom works. It can happen miraculously. It happened miraculously to me. I met Jesus in my living room, and it lasted almost a full day. I played the same song over and over and over. It was so anointed. It was a moment that I could never compare to an experience I had here. But here... We're trying to edify and build each other up, bring in new believers so they can experience that moment for themselves. And we usually do really good until pastor comes up to us and says, hey, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, seven times and you'll be healed or whatever it is specifically for you because each one of us is different. Go back to work. <laughs> you can't leave that job. Go 
to the school. Go set a desk up at the front and pray for people. Go to the homeless shelter and pass out meals to the neighborhood. Whatever that process is for you is to help you become and be. So go wash in the Albana and the Parfar. We break down some of these words for you, okay? Nahum means pleasantness. Elisha, God of supplication. The Jordan means to descend or to go down. He, Elisha said, go. God of supplication said, go and wash yourself and descend and go down. So in a sense, I believe that it's to be humble. Dirty water. It's not as clean as the Albana and the Parfar, which means to build and rapidly or rapid. Sometimes we have these preconceived ideas that we can do it ourselves and we're going to do it quickly. And that's not the case all the time. Sometimes it's in that humility of going down and letting go of ourselves that we truly receive our healing. We become complacent. And we start to believe, we become complacent because we don't want to do that. We don't want to go that far. We don't want to go that distance. We don't want to go through this process. It's hard. It's hard. We don't want to push that past that point of uncomfortable. And we get stuck in that spot. And we start lying to ourselves, saying, well, I hadn't received my healing yet. I've, I've dipped five times, and it's still here. I went five times, and I've still got my leprosy. Maybe if I just keep covering it up. And I, I, they know, I know. I was in this process, too. I knew that out there wasn't the answer because I was broken. I was tore up. I was chewed up and spit out. I knew I couldn't go out there for my answer, but I knew that if I didn't confront my issue here, that I'd never get better, so just cover it up. Just like we did out there. We, did, we were successful at doing it out there, so maybe it'll apply in here. Maybe we can cover it up here. They'll never see it. They won't know I'm addicted to porn. They won't know that I drink after I leave church. They won't know. But it's killing us. It's killing us. It's going to rot. It's going to eventually go from eating our skin up. And once it runs out of skin, it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's just, just killing us. Until we let go of our way of thinking and truly rely on God and commit to this complete process of restoration, we can never have the fulfillment and the fullest of what God says we can have. We, we then become in danger of being Hophni and Phineas. Why do I say that? How do we, how do we become like them? Because we're preaching a gospel that's not the real gospel. We're leaning up against the back wall. We're preaching with our actions. We get to the point where this is as much praise as I can give. And somebody sees that man and says, wow, he's in this body of Christ, man. And look, it's working for him. He's all covered up. It's working for him. That's all I got to do. You know, uh, uh, I, I had this happen to me. I was a baby in Christ. I just came to church, and I was trying to get my marriage restored. And I came across this Christian that I, I esteemed highly. And through some conversations we had with them, he, 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 they, there's actually more than one, they said, you know, pornography isn't that bad as long as you're just watching it with your wife. All right. <laughs> I was fresh from out there, and I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> I'm like, hey, hang on. Hang on. I said, well, no, no, because you're thinking of your wife and not the other woman. What Jesus are you preaching because whenever you fail to address that issue in your life, when you fail to say, 
It's not right. I gotta, I gotta overcome this obstacle. You're preaching a gospel that's not the same gospel I'm reading. It's not the same gospel I'm reading. It hurts. It's rotting our flesh. It's contagious. And so that's why Israel wanted to cast them out of the city. He said, get out. We don't want anybody else affected in here. But out there, you could be right among them. Just covered up. Are we the ones that's causing our brother to stumble? Are we in danger of being Hophni and Phineas? I'm not beating you up. Understand, that's not, I'm not rebuking anybody. I'm trying to create or help edify each other to becoming Christ-like. That's our goal. If we, if we lose sight of the goal, if we lose sight of the goal, then what are we doing? It says Romans uh, 14, 13, it says, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Uh, Romans 14, 19 says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which makes for peace the things by which one may edify another, to build up, to become stronger, to become better. Or are we being that stumbling block? What is it to you? Your drink? Your boyfriend? Your chat buddy on Facebook? What Jesus are you preaching to those? Because if you haven't overcome that obstacle, I'm telling you, your words that you're speaking are really lenient in those areas. You got a little bit of water from up here and a little bit of dirt from out there. What does that make? Mud. And you can't move in mud. <laughs> you can't move in mud. You, know, you move, but you're moving a lot slower than those who are moving on either water or in dirt. It's like being lukewarm. It's the same difference. So lukewarm. That's what it is. Lukewarm. And we're not called to be lukewarm. Huh? That was that uh, Lecrae song. I love it. Every time I think of that, it says, it says, cold water you drink, hot water you cook. What does lukewarm do? Just sits and it looks. I love it. I love it. Ephesians 4 in the message, please. Uh, Ephesians 4, uh, 17 through 19. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no one going along with the crowd, the empty-headed, mindless crowd. They refused for so long to deal with God that they've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore, feeling no pain. They let themselves go into sexual obsessions, addicted to every sort of perversions. But that's no life for you. You've learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, being well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have any excuse to be ignorant of everything. And I do mean everything. Connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten, eating your flesh, chewing you up, and spitting you out through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. What this adds up to then is there's no more lies, no more pretenses. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. After all, when you lie to yourself, I'm sorry, when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. You know, uh, I heard this the other day from Damon, and I really really grabbed a hold of it. He said, you know, you're really off the hook whenever you believe you're just going to be Christ's ambassador. He said, when you're an ambassador, you're in the presence of the king. You're directed to go, and you leave the presence of the king, and you go, 
and you try to convey that. But whenever you're called to be in his image, when you're called, we're all called to be in Christ's image. When you're in his image, when you're in the image, when you're in the mirror and you're looking at yourself, when you leave the mirror, there's no more image. And if we're staring at Christ, if we're reflecting Christ, we're that mirror. We have to stay in that mirror to properly convey Jesus. And when we leave his presence, we're no longer reflecting Christ. We're reflecting ourselves. That's deep. That's deep, but that's exactly what we're called to do. We're not called to reflect anything else but Jesus. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you. It is the most intimate part of your life. Making it, make it fit for himself. Do not, don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break from all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Profane talk. Be gentle with one another. Sensitive. Forgiving one another quickly, thoroughly as Christ forgave you. There's no condemnation in Christ. We're all forgiven. We all have the equal opportunity to progress with this walk. We're family. We're here to build you up. And it breaks our heart just I'm sure as much as it does him when we try to go back to those dead things. Also heard this the other day. It says, Flesh police is not a proper ministry title. If we're in here and we're judging, trying to figure out what's God and what's not in here, we're missing it. Now, I don't think that we would even have to speak in here if we would take the focus off of everybody else and what they're doing and what they're not doing and focus in on ourselves. Put the mirror back on us. What are we doing? What Jesus are we reflecting? We wouldn't have to speak. We probably would have a Holy Ghost service every time. But a lot of times we're so distracted because we're trying to bring what's out there into here. And it's just constantly distracting us from what we're called to do and what we're called to be. First uh, John 1, 5 through 9 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all of our sin. If, if we say we have no sin, James Payne Version says, you're in danger of becoming like Hophni and Phineas. You know, one thing I really thought of the other day is when Naaman got done with that process, that seventh dip, it says that he came out with flesh like a child. Flesh like a child. What are we, what are we called in order to, what is the kingdom of heaven? To inherit the kingdom of heaven, we first must become like a child. Matthew 18, verse 3 says, And truly I tell you, unless you change, change, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The same river that John the Baptist was preaching a message that was crazy. Repent and be baptized. The same water that Jesus himself was baptized in. The same water that they had to cross over to get in their promised land. 
the same water, humility, that we have to go through, that we have to go through this process to get what we're called to have. Romans 12, verse 2, and I'm done. A couple more in a minute. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Let us not value how successful we are out there. And let's not bring out there in here. Because out there has no place in here. Let us be Christ's reflection. Remember, our goal is not to be successful in here. Our goal is to reflect Jesus. This is the process. This is the summation of what we're called to do. So simple, yet so difficult. 2 Corinthians 12.9 says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I would rather boast of my infirmities than the, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometime we, we came through that door, and we were like Hannah, and we were crying, needing a Savior, needing a promise. We got all muddied up, believing that if I just don't tell anybody my issues, then I just don't have issues anymore. And it's not the truth. If we're going to reflect Jesus to those people out there, we've got to get real in here. It's hard, I know. I, I didn't want to tell anybody. In fact, I didn't tell anybody. I just got caught. <laughs> I got, I did. I come through this, and I was like, well, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm weak. I'm, I'm dying. That's what I should have been saying. I'm dying. Had I spoke to my brothers and my sisters at that time when I was my weakest, had I been honest and truthful about my situation with my spouse or my brother, or maybe we just, maybe that's the problem. We don't see each other as brothers and sisters. We don't, we just see each other as that person we see on Sunday. But each one of us is going through this process, and we're in different areas of that process, but we have to understand we're family. We're called to build each other up and to edify each other. There's no condemnation. We understand we're all in this process. We're all in this process. I pray that we all open up, stop looking at our brothers and sisters. We're not called to be better than them. We're not called to be more holy than them and stop at that point right there as soon as we pass their mark. I pray that we receive the revelation that we're called to be like Christ. That we stop comparing ourselves with each other and start comparing ourselves to Jesus. That we walk in truth and humility. That we grab a hold of our promise. That we wouldn't put our needs above our promise. Let God be sufficient in all things. That God gives us the grace to overcome not just to cover. We give you praise this day, Father. And we believe, Father, that you truly have our best, best our interest. Amen. That's it. Amen. So we thank y'all guys. Uh, Pastor Ned, I, re I really believe Pastor Ned during prayer this morning hit exactly 
what the heart of my message was. Because I don't want you to walk out of here feeling condemned that I'm not making it. I'm, I just might as well abandon this whole thing. And she hit it, and I asked her to close out for me with this one thing. Uh, this morning in prayer, I saw uh, the Lord led me to a scripture in uh, Second Chronicles. And um, it, when Hezekiah was, uh, had torn down the altars and they had rebuilt the altar of the Lord and the enemy came up to the children of Israel and told them, you know, look, your king is now asking you just to come to worship to one, at one altar. And the enemy said, you know, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And, but we know that there is only one altar. There's only, there's only one way to Jesus. There's only, you know, I mean, Jesus is one way to the Father. That's Jesus. But what I saw, so I had a vision. It was so clear. It was so vivid. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, when they would build an altar, the Lord told them to take stones and to put the stones to make the altar. They were not allowed to use hewn stone. They weren't allowed to put any tool to it and cut it and shape it in any way because it had to be authentic the way that God had created it because we don't get to choose the way our altars look. Amen? So what I saw in this vision, though, was an altar that was set up, and it had both stones that were taken that were not messed with, and it also had stones that were hewn. And it, the altar was made of both. And what I felt so impressed with the Lord was like, there are so many of us that love Jesus. We love him. We're trying to serve him. We, we want to be pleasing unto him. But we have these altar. We have this one altar in our lives. And it's only one. We're not trying to serve another God. We're trying to serve Jesus. But we have both things that we are shaping and things that we're allowing God to shape. And the problem is the Lord requires that the entire altar be holy. All of it has to be holy. And if we take one, one stone and we shape it into something that is easier for us to swallow and deal with and put that on the altar, original, at, at some point, that's going to influence another one. And we'll begin to see that when God says something to us, we don't like it, and we'll shape that truth too. So it's more comfortable for us. And what we don't realize is the more that we let one compromise and one unholy piece in, it will begin to infect everything else on that altar. And then before you know it, the altar's not holy anymore. And it's not suitable for sacrifice. And so we have to be cautious. I told Lorinda, it's like we say, we love Jesus, but we think a woman should be, have, have the right to choose whether or not she wants to have an abortion. That's not a holy thought. And that one thought that compromises whether or not you can kill a life or not will begin to compromise whether or not you, can, you should give. It will begin to compromise whether or not you can, you know, do, you can use euthanasia on older people. It will begin to compromise one thought after the other. Our altars are supposed to be holy. And the issue is that Jesus this morning was like, Annette, there is a love for me. There's only one altar, but it's time for us to begin to take what we build. And the issue is what I saw was like there was a fear that rose up in our hearts that when we took the one thing out that God reveals to us is not him, we're afraid that the entire thing is going to crumble. But the Lord says what he has put in there is able to hold up the altar and that he will let that new thing come in. And re you're not going to lose all the Jesus you have just because he's going to confront one thought in your life. But we think that one thought is the thing that's going to make everything collapse. If he deals with this thing, then everything else is going to fold. The Lord said no, because what's already there is holy, and it will, it will stand. You taking out the thing that you thought of and the truth that you, you like, and when he replaces it with his truth, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. He loves us. Amen? I wanted to add one thing. In the book of James, which is funny, in chapter 5, he tells us to confess our sins one to another. And that when we come one to another and we confess our sins, that then we can pray for one another and our prayers are effective. And they make, they make the kingdom of heaven come to our situations. And the enemy wants to keep us quiet. When James was talking about if he would just come and it confessed, it, it's the truth. If he would have come and confessed what happened and the pain would have been lessened because he would have come to a believer and a believer would have said, you know what, I don't judge you. I'm, I'm just as weak as you are, but let's pray. And it would have made power effective and available. And it could, have, it could have changed the situation completely. So do not be afraid to tell your brothers and sisters that you have covenant with in Christ Jesus what you're going through. 
If you keep silent, you keep control. Amen? Amen. I love you. You want an altar call? Why are you grinning? Because I love you. That was not even authentic. A whole bunch. What do you mean it wasn't authentic? You better hush. I love you. Um, I want to say something. Um. Two things that are said about this church is that we are real, <clears throat> that we have the presence of God. But then the other side that kind of is uh, the negative and the positive, and, and it's, well, I, I said two things, but it's, there's three, but the thir- third is not part of the two that are good. And the third part is, is that we deal with stuff head on, and we don't pull punches, and we preach the truth but also the other portion of that is that I'm really hard and high expectations <clears throat> which then people feel condemned or, or, or they feel it's critical but the thing in that is, is that our heart's desire is it's that one thing that's yours that needs to be pulled out and I, I know that's what God's doing but I don't know what it is in you. God does, and he's just using us. Because I say me a lot of times, and I take the brunt of it, but it's all of us in leadership that, that operate this church. He's using us to help you identify that one thing to pull it out. And what I, I just want to encourage you on is that our heart is never to crush you but to empower you and enable you to become what God has called you to be. Whether that is a stay-at-home mom raising your children, whether that's a businesswoman or businessman, whether that's a five-fold minister, whatever that is, whatever you're called to be, and then the abundance and the fullness of that in your walk, enjoying and receiving all the benefits that God has for you, whether that's in financial, that's in in pleasures, that's in relationships, all of the encompassing fullness of the abundant life that God has for you. And what they're talking about is in that when the sin was gone from Naaman, he then walked in a authority and a power because the, the, the leprosy was a weakness and he couldn't be who he was all supposed to be because the weakness was there. And, and as that is pulled out, we become the fullness of what we're supposed to be. And I said all this to say this, is our heart is never to tear down or to find out your issue and point it out. It is to restore you. James got caught, and his wife was taking him to the cross to be crucified. She had enough ammunition to destroy him and Verbally, physically, financially, and every means there were. And the thing is, is he was ready to say, I'm not worth it. And I'm not saying this to tell you anything about me. Because really, it was all about them. I told her, and worked on her about forgiving him and loving him through it. I talked to him about who he was called to be and where he was supposed to be. And what he had done could have disqualified him for doing what God had called him to be. But we didn't focus on that. We focused on what's the root of the issue, what God's doing in your life, and who is God, and where are you supposed to be called to. And just because you messed up does not disqualify you for what you are called to be. And because I was willing to invest and take the lumps of people accusing us or tearing us down, they are now the pastors of this church. Turn the phone off, Nona. (laughs) 
And I said that not for you to give me accolades, but for you to give them accolades because they were embarrassed. They were exposed naked in front of everybody. And a lot of people knew what was going on, and they still had the, the, the courage to step in and do what they were called to do. And that's the problem is most of us, okay, we start dealing with something and, and we start uh, picking at something, and we're too embarrassed to be exposed to move through the embarrassment, move past the shame to get to the place where God wants to get us to. And that's the whole purpose of what Satan is trying to do is to put shame on you and say you're not worthy. But none of us are worthy. We're only worthy because of him. Amen? And the last reason why I said that is because I want you to do the same thing because you have the power of life and death in your tongue. And someone could be messed up and mess up and and screw up or whatever the issue is, and you can destroy them with your tongue. Or you can speak life to them and edify them and help them get to where they're supposed to be faster and quicker. Because there's power in the King of Kings, and when a heart is right towards God, no matter how much you speak crap over them, God's going to get them through. You're just another fight through it. Right? Right? But if we will join in with God and we'll build them up and lift them up, they'll be stronger, better, quicker. Amen? Awesome word. Y'all give him a hand. Okay. You have friends. You have family. You have people you don't like that are sick and got issues this week and are out. I want you to see who's out. I want you to call them. I don't want you to berate them because they're out. I want you to pray for them. I want you to love on them. I want you to encourage them because there's a lot of battles, not just the sickness. There's a lot of other battles going on. We, the body, heal the body. Amen? So go find someone and bless them. Shake hands, hug next. Don't get mixed up. We'll see you Wednesday. Bring a friend. Bring an enemy. Bring somebody. We'll see you tonight for Destiny Discovery classes. Hey, wait, one last thing. If you are a deacon, uh, elder, assimilation, Anybody that's on the database system, if you'll be here at 6, uh, I'll be here to help. I'm going to start doing that before class to help you get better at the system. So be he- I will be here at 6 o'clock at 5th Street. Good night. Yes. Good afternoon. <laughs>